Hi everyone, welcome to day two of our spring training. If you have any questions during today's session, please submit those and we'll get to those at the end. Now, let's take a look at our topics. So the two topics that we're gonna be talking about today is gonna be our hot gas defrost board that's gonna be on our heat pumps. And the second thing we're gonna be looking at is checking charge. On our hot gas defrost board, this board will be found on our two stage and our single stage pieces of equipment. This board is categorized as our adaptive demand defrost board. This means that it takes into account runtime and temperature inputs on the board on when the unit will go into defrost. Hot gas defrost will ensure complete defrost with units with microchannel coils. We also have a digital readout to help ensure proper diagnosis and give you codes on your unit operation. The digital status indicator will show faults and will also give you operating codes. SC will stand for your short cycle timer. C1 is your first stage cooling. H1 is going to be your first stage heat pump operation. Defrost mode will have a DF. And if you see an exclamation point or will be a dash in a period on the digital, that just means you're in standby mode and ready for a call. Now, if you have two stage piece of equipment, you will also have a C2 and an H2, which will indicate second stage for that unit. When it comes to codes, what you'll also have are up to five different fault codes on the board. The first code will be a 01, and that's gonna be your low pressure switch fault. The second one will be a high pressure switch fault at an 02 code. And then your 03 and your 04 codes are gonna be revolving around the temperature sensors on the unit. So the O3 is going to be your ambient sensor, which is going to be located in the control panel. And then your O4 code is going to be the coil sensor, which is located at the bottom of the coil on the inside. And then if you were to get an O5 code, that is going to be just a generic board fault. So if you are able to get a O5 code on the board, you want to replace the defrost board. We categorize this board as an adaptive demand defrost board, which again will take into account your outdoor ambient temperature and the coil temperature. It will then calculate when the unit should go into defrost mode. And again, these are going to be by the outdoor coil sensor and the ambient sensor, which are inputs on your defrost board. A sacrificial defrost will occur at unit startup or power operation. Coil must be 25 degrees or below during heating mode and runs for a minimum of 35 minutes. There will be a five minute time delay if the following happens. If a cycle were to just end and you were to then recall another heating or a cooling cycle, you'll have an SC code pop up. Also, if power was just applied, say on a new startup, or if you had a power outage and power were to come back, you will automatically have a five minute time delay. And then also, if you're switching from heat pump mode to cooling mode, that will also give you a five minute time delay on the board. Now, if you're in the middle of troubleshooting and you want to bypass that short cycle timer, on our board, we have test pins here that if you were to jump those test pins out for one second, that'll bypass your SC or your five minute time delay. On this board as well, we have what we call our term temperature jumper. Basically what this is, is it allows you to set your termination temperature on the unit to determine when you should come out of defrost mode. Now, if you're in a more wetter climate or a humid climate, you're gonna to wanna to have a longer defrost um, mode to ensure that the coil properly defrosts. Versus say if you're in the Southwest where you don't have much humidity at all, you don't need to be in defrost that long. So what that looks like on the board is that you have a jumper selection from 50 degrees all the way up to 80 degrees to determine when you want that unit to kick out a defrost. So again, if you're in a more uh, humid climate or wetter climate, what I would suggest is that you have your defrost termination set to either about 70 or maybe up to 80 degrees on the board. Now, another thing that you may wanna just keep in mind is that if the unit's installed by a body of water, you may have a lot of humidity that's come off either a lake um, or a river that you need to take into account for. So again, this is just something you wanna take a look at when either installing the equipment or if you're coming back on a service call. 
And now let's take a look at a defrost board on a unit. What we have here is our hot gas bypass board. I've applied power to the unit. And as you can see on our digital display, we've got our exclamation point or our dash in our period, which just means we're in standby mode, ready for a call. So let's give the unit a call. So now that we've given the system a call, we have our SC code, which just stands for our short cycle or a five minute time delay. We're getting this fault code because we just reapplied power to the equipment. And now that the short cycle delay has elapsed, we're now in C1. So C1 is just cooling stage one. Now the unit that we're working on is a 14 sear heat pump, single stage. So you're only gonna see C1 for cooling and H1 for heat pump mode. Now, if we wanted to bypass our short cycle timer, basically all you would have to do is take either a jumper wire or a slotted screwdriver. And in the top corner here of our board, we have our jumper pins. And all you'd have to do is jump those two little pins for one second, and that would bypass our short cycle timer. Now, if you have a delay on your thermostat, we'll have to wait for that in order to end. But as far as the defrost board goes, that's how you would bypass your short cycle timer. Now, basically what I wanna do here, is just kind of throw some codes on the board. So what we'll do on our first go around is we'll throw a pressure switch code. So all I'm gonna do is just take one of our pressure switch wires and just pull it right off our board here. So some guys will call in and say, I've got a 20 code. Um, so what you're actually looking at here is an O2 fault code. Now the O2 fault code, remember, is a high pressure switch fault. So just keep in mind, if you're dealing with a heat pump in cooling mode, this would also apply obviously to an, an air conditioner. Uh, the two main things, if you get your a uh, high head pressure switch is one, make sure that the condenser fan motor is turning when uh, the system is running. And then also just make sure that the condenser coil is clean as well. Those are the two main things we go after when looking at a high head pressure switch in cooling mode. If you're in the fall, in the heating season, you're gonna be looking at either an overcharge scenario, uh, a low indoor airflow scenario, as well during heat pump mode operation. So now that we have our O2 code, because basically I opened our our head pressure switch. Let's re-engage our pressure switch and see what happens. So what we currently have is the board cycling back and forth from O2 to our SC code. So basically the board by default is gonna give you that short cycle timer and that O2 fault code as a stored fault code on that board. Again, if you wanna bypass your time delay, all you have to do is just take a screwdriver like what I'm gonna do here. Short the test pins out for one second and that'll pop you back into whatever mode uh, you're running at, whether that's cooling mode or heat pump mode. Now, another thing I wanna point out is that our board is now cycling between our C1 and our O2 code. So our O2 code is now a stored fault code on this board. In order to clear that, what you would need to do is make sure that you don't have a call to the unit and then you can jump your two test pins again and that'll clear your fault code. So let's try that. So what I'm gonna do here is just take my Y wire and I'm gonna unwire nut this guy, which will kill our unit. So now what you're seeing on the defrost board is an O2 and the exclamation point, meaning uh, we're ready to go for another call, but then we've also went off on a high head pressure switch at some point. So again, a stored fault code is not gonna affect how the system runs. Um, it's just letting you know that at some point in time, we had, a, we had a high head pressure switch open on us. Now, this would apply to our low pressure switch as well. So everything that we're kind of going over would apply to our low pressure switch. 
So what I'll do to clear the board is I'll take a screwdriver and just short our test pins out for one second. And that cleared our board. So now our O2 code goes away and we're left with an exclamation point. So it's very important that when you want to clear the board, you need to make sure you don't have a call. So the easiest thing that I tell guys on the phone is just go to your thermostat wire and then just unwire nut your low voltage instead of running inside, killing the stat, and then having to go back outside and all that good stuff. So what, what I'll do now is take our Y wire, reconnect it and see what happens. Okay, so now that we've reconnected our call from our thermostat, we immediately go into an SC code, which is our short cycle. So let's take our screwdriver and jump our test pins out for one second. All right, so with jumping our test pins out, we're back into C1, into regular cooling mode operation. Now, if we were on the phone with you guys calling us on an O2 code, we would be going over some readings with you. We'd be looking at our superheat, our subcooling number, wanting to know what your outdoor temperatures are, what your line temperatures are to help determine what's going on with the system and where the refrigerant's at. Now, everything that we, again, we just looked at would apply to an O2 code operation, which is a low pressure switch fault code. So now what I've done is place the unit in heat pump mode. So let's jump our test pins to bypass our short cycle timer. So now our unit is running in H1 for our display, which is telling us we're running in heat pump mode operation. Now, if you had a two stage unit, just remember you'd have an H1 and an H2, but for our unit, we've got 14 sear heat pump, which is our single stage unit. Now, one thing that I just wanna uh, remind you guys is that our reversing valve is energized in cooling mode. So guys that have been calling into us, if you see an H1, and you're wondering why you're in heat pump mode when you think you're calling for cooling, uh, it's gonna be because you most likely have zero voltage on your orange wire for your O, which is your reversing valve. So that's one place that you wanna look at when it comes to troubleshooting. One, just to make sure that between your common and your O terminal that you've got 24 volts, which would give you uh, cooling mode operation. Now let's throw another fault code and um, go through that again. So what I'm gonna do here is pull off our outdoor ambient sensor on our unit, which now generates an O3 code. Because we're running in heat pump mode operation, the board doesn't know what the outdoor temperature is in order to properly put the unit into defrost mode. So if you come up on a unit and you've got a sensor fault, the heat pump is not gonna run. I wanted to show you guys that if you were to have a bad sensor, whether it was open or shorted, and you were to see, you know, like an O3 code, for example. So let's say we went to uh, the distributor, got a new sensor. Let's plug this guy back in and see what happens. So now what we've got is our short cycle timer on the board. And now let's jump our test pins out. Now, what I did here is I let my uh, screwdriver be on there a little bit too long. So what we're actually in right now is defrost mode. So what you're seeing there on the board, DF, is uh, defrost mode operation, and um, I've got no condenser fan motor, units running in defrost mode at the moment. Now again, uh, your defrost mode is going to terminate um, either at the 11 minutes or uh, once you hit the coil temperature set point on that. We just heard our reversing valve shift. Now we're running back in H1 which is heat pump mode operation.
Also too, just like in cooling mode, we've got a O3 code along with an H1. All that's telling you is, is that you have a stored code on the board. And uh, if you wanted to clear it, all you'd have to do is take the call away, jump the two test pins, and um, just like what we did in cooling mode. So let's do that real quick. So we took our call away, take our screwdriver here, Now that we've cleared the board, we can take our Y wire, reconnect it. All right, so now what we've got is an SC code back on our board that we clear the fault. Again, take your screwdriver, jump the pins out. And what it's doing now is just going through a sacrificial defrost on that unit. We'll give it a second here, let it go through its defrost cycle. And one thing that I do wanna point out on this board while we're waiting on that on the defrost is on this board here, uh, I do have a couple of questions that I'll get on this jumper pin down here. So we have what we call our termination temperature and basically what this is, is you can set what you want the coil temperature to reach during defrost mode. So if you're like in a wetter climate or by a pond or a lake, for example, you would wanna take this jumper and you would wanna move it to a higher set point versus guys that are uh, in the Arizona territory where you've got uh, very low humidity, you don't need to have uh, the unit stay in defrost that long. So. Uh, but these little pins here uh, are adjustable and you can pick what termination temperature that you want to uh, set on that. Another thing too that I do want to point out on this board is our W2 out terminal, which is right here. So this is a very common question we get out of in, into tech services. At the factory level, when you open up this panel, you're going to have a black wire hanging from your W2 out terminal. Um, basically the question goes is where, where does this wire go? Uh, the main thing is, is that when the board goes into defrost mode, it's going to output voltage on your W2 out to your indoor unit, which will, which is either a, a furnace or a heater strip on an air handler. And um, that'll help supplement uh, the air coming out of your register so it's not so cold. So the main thing is, is that if you don't hook that wire up, uh, you're going to have pretty cold air coming out of your registers when the unit goes into uh, defrost mode. So now that we've cleared the board, we've got an H1 and we're humming along just good in heat pump mode. Another topic that I wanna cover with you guys is in relation to the condenser fan motor and when and when it doesn't kick on. A question that we get into tech service is that a tech goes up to a unit and then bumps the contactor, but the condenser fan motor doesn't kick on. Is that normal, yes or no? And the answer is, is that yes, that is normal because the defrost board is what controls the condenser fan motor. So if we look at our defrost board here, you'll have a fan one and a fan two terminal, and this is your break when it comes to your condenser fan motor. So if you were to look at the wiring diagram on your unit, you'll actually see that the condenser fan motor line voltage will wire into your fan one and your fan two terminal. When it comes to the condenser fan motor not turning on when you hit the contactor, that in itself is normal. So don't jump directly to replacing the condenser fan motor. Um, some guys will jump right into replacing the defrost board. I always try to go through a voltage check to make sure that we're getting voltage in the appropriate places before we replace any parts. That is a little bit on the condenser fan motor on a heat pump. And with that, let's take a look at checking charge. So when checking charge, you wanna make sure that the system you're working on is a proper match. The way to figure out if your system is a proper match is by one of three ways. You can look at the QRD, which is available on our literature library, and the QRD will give you the whole matchups for that particular condenser. The next thing you can take a look at is the tech spec of the condenser, because we also put the matchups in that document. 
And the third thing you can look at is the AHRI website. When looking at the AHRI website, you wanna make sure that you put in a base model number. If you get too detailed with the actual model number, it may limit you to the scope of matches that will auto-populate on their website. So what I would do is just start with a base series number and then branch off from there. The next thing that I really want you guys to remember is ABC, airflow before charged. So when you're coming up on a system, either you're doing a clean and check or you may be coming up to diagnose a refrigerant problem, you wanna make sure that your airflow is set properly. And one, that can be just the actual blower speed, but there's a lot of other factors that can go into the overall performance of your system. And the main thing is the actual airflow going across your indoor coil. Because if you don't have the airflow to support the system, it's not gonna run properly. So the biggest things that you wanna just keep in mind on when coming up to either a clean and check or for troubleshooting is a dirty return air filter, a blower speed or a dirty blower wheel will also cause an airflow problem. The other thing is when it comes to evap coils, you may have to take that delta plate off to look underneath the coil to make sure it's not packed. And then really the fourth thing is, is relation to duct work. Now it could be as simple as closed registers, or you may actually may have um, restrictive duct work that can give you a high static pressure. But the main thing that I want you guys to, to think about when you come up on a system is don't forget what your airflow looks like because you can spend all this time troubleshooting with refrigerant, but if you don't have the airflow to support it, you're never gonna be able to charge that system properly. Now, when checking charge, you wanna to refer to the QRD for your base overall charge. Now, depending on the model number, it's gonna be a little bit different in that you may have a base charge for 15 feet or you may have a base charge for 20 feet. Basically, what I'll tell you is just refer to the QRD to get that number. If you are over that 15 or 20 foot mark, you will then have to add refrigerant. So this is all dependent on what your suction line size is. So for systems that are using a three quarter inch suction size, you're gonna be using 0.6 ounces per foot. If you're seven eighths, you're gonna be 0.7 ounces per foot. And if you're running an inch and an eighth suction line, you're gonna be 0.8 ounces per foot after that 15 or 20 foot mark. Orifice changes and required TXV changes will also be found in the QRD document. The main thing that I want you guys to take away from that is when installing a heat pump or an air conditioner, if you have an indoor coil, say that's gonna sit on top of a furnace, you may have to either change the piston on the inside or you may have to actually install a TXV. Now, when dealing with air handlers, it's really just gonna be a coil for coil match and you shouldn't have to actually install a TXV, what you may have to do is change the pistons. Now on heat pumps, you're going to have a piston on the outdoor for our 14 sear equipment. On our 16 sear equipment, you're going to have a TXV. So remember when installing equipment, just look at the QRD sheet to make sure that you have the proper metering devices and that will help your install go a lot smoother. When it comes to checking charge, two things that you need to look at is your superheat and your subcooling. To calculate your superheat, you need to take your suction line temperature and then you subtract your low side saturation temperature. It is also important to find what your target superheat number is, and this is calculated by taking an outdoor dry bulb and an indoor wet bulb by using a psychrometer. The second thing that you're gonna take a look at is your subcooling. Subcooling is calculated by taking high side saturation temperature and subtracting it by your liquid line temperature. Piston driven systems are charged by superheat and TXV driven systems are charged by subcooling. On TXV driven systems, you wanna make sure you look at your superheat number. The reason for this is that you wanna make sure that the TXV is operating properly. The TXVs that we have on our indoor coils and our outdoor coils for our 16 sear equipment are going to be roughly 10 to 15 degrees of superheat. So even though you're charging by subcooling on a TXV driven system, you also want to look at your superheat to make sure your TXV is doing what it should. Charging information can be found on the back of the control panel 
and more information can be found on the supplemental charging document. Now, this charging document is available on our technical literature library. This is just an example of a page from the document. Basically, what we include on that is high side and low side pressure, along with superheat and subcooling numbers and a discharge temperature. And that'll be different depending on what tonnage you're working on, along with if you're in cooling or in heat pump mode operation. Another way to check charge is by going to our charge calculator website, which is just chargecalculator.com, or on the outside portion of the control panel, you may see a charge me sticker that is a QR reader code. That sticker will take you directly to that website. So with that being said, let's take a look at an actual unit when it comes to charging. All right, guys, so what we're going to do is check charge on an actual condenser. So the unit that I have here is going to be a 14 sear single stage heat pump. And there's a couple different ways you can check charge again. The first way that you can do it is by using a digital gauge set, which makes it a whole lot easier when it comes to calculating your superheat and your subcooling. Uh, the more traditional way is to use gauges and a thermal couple to then calculate your superheat and your subcooling. Another thing we're going to look at is the charge calculator. I want to show you guys the benefits of using the charge calculator when checking charge. And there's a couple different ways you can get to it. One, you can use the QR reader code on the charge me sticker, which is found on the outside of the panels. Or you can go to your browser and just type in chargecalculator.com and that'll get you directly to the charge calculator website. So what I'm going to do today is use my computer and just my web browser to get to the charge calculator. So the first thing I'm going to do is type in chargecalculator.com in my browser, which will take us to the charge calculator website. So this is our homepage for the charge calculator. Uh, the two things that we just require from you guys is one, a zip code and just an email address to sign into our charge calculator. So once you do that, you'll hit sign in and it'll take you to our first screen here, which you'll end up putting your type of system that you have in, which will be what type of coils that you have along with the tonnage of the unit and our sear value. So the first option that we need to select is what our coils are on our indoor and outdoor equipment. So the cart that we have here for our testing is going to have micro channel to micro channel. So that's gonna be our first selection here. The next thing that we're gonna be looking at is what our metering device is on our indoor equipment. So for the equipment that we're using today, we'll have a TXV, and then you'll select your tonnage, and the unit that we have here is a two ton. Next, you'll select your sear value, which is 14 sear. It'll then ask you what size your suction line is, which is going to be three quarter. And then by default, we put in 15 feet for your overall line set. So with that, we'll, we'll leave this at 15 feet on that. And the next thing that you need to look at is the overall charge amount for your particular system. Now, if you wanted to hit calculate base charge at the bottom, basically what that will do is take an average of the two ton units that we have and it's going to give you an average of what that base charge would be. It's not going to give you the exact 100% charge for your particular model. It's going to give you an average. So it will get pretty close, generally speaking, on that. Now, if you wanted to get your exact amount as far as what your charge requires for your system, what you can do down here is hit this question mark. This will take you directly to our literature library. What you then can do is pick your unit. We'll look at our QRD sheet here. And for our two ton system here, we're looking at 105 ounces of refrigerant charge that would be needed for 15 feet worth of line set. Now this doesn't account to your indoor equipment. so. Sometimes, depending on your indoor equipment, you may or may not need to add an additional charge amount. Now, if your line set is over that 15 foot mark, you'll then have to add that number into your overall calculation. But if we go back to our, our charging calculator here, 
if you were to go through that QRD sheet, find out what your exact amount of charge would be for your system, take into account your line set length and what your indoor equipment is, and you come up with that number, you will then put that number into this charge box. And that will be the number you'll go off of when looking at the charge calculator. I'm not gonna actually go through uh, finding out what the exact charge is. I'll just take what our average will be and that's how we'll look at the charge amount on our particular system. Next, it's gonna ask you for your conditions that you'll be running at. So in our testing room, it is a little bit cooler in here. So the room temperature that we have is about 70 degrees. The next thing that you'll select is your humidity level. We'll leave that about 50. And then our indoor dry bulb temperature is about 70-ish, we'll call it 70 degrees, as far as our indoor dry bulb. You'll scroll down here, and then you'll just hit start timer. The next screen that you'll come to, you'll be needing to input your suction line and your liquid line pressure, along with your liquid line temperature and your suction line temperature. And this will help calculate our superheat and our subcooling. So with that, let's start up our system and see what we got. So now that the system's been running for a couple of minutes, let's take a look at our readings and see what we've got. So the first thing that we need to look at per our charge calculator is our liquid pressure. So for our high side pressure, what we're running is about, let's call it 262 for our high side pressure. The next reading that we need to get is our liquid line temperature. So we did have our probes here on our gauges. So I do have a clamp on our liquid line and that's gonna be, let's call it 70 degrees on our liquid line. The next thing that we'll take a look at is our suction pressure, which we're running about, let's call it 133. And then our suction line temperature, let's call it uh, about 57 for our suction line temperature. We'll then hit calculate charge. And per the beginning of our charge calculator, when we put in our tonnage, what our coils were, the suction line size, all that good stuff. When we did all that in the beginning, and when we come to this screen here, it's gonna tell us what we've got a percentage wise for our charge level on our system. So given our readings that we've had and what we've uh, told the charge calculator, what type of system we've got, we're looking at 110% of refrigerant for this system, which tells me I'm overcharged. Now, I kind of already knew that because if we take a look at our subcooling here, with 11 degrees of superheat, we know our TXV is working as it should. And our subcooling number is 16 degrees. So we know that we're overcharged. Normally about subcooling, I wanna be roughly 10 to 12 degrees on our subcool, but 16 degrees, I know we're, that we're overcharged, uh, just kind of going off that number and what our conditions are. And that also is gonna reflect into our charge calculator. So with our charge calculator, if you uh, swipe down, we'll have some other data here. So you'll see what pressures and line temperatures that we put in along with the percentage of the refrigerant in the system. And then it also just kind of gives a brief summary of what we put in at the beginning here at the bottom under our system configuration. Now let's say that we ended up having like a two and a half ton unit. You can go into edit system configuration and edit those settings. Now, if we wanted to then recalculate our charge, so we know that we're overcharged. So we'll have to take the recovery tank, bleed some refrigerant out, and, and get our charge uh, numbers down. So let's take some refrigerant out, let's recheck the charge, and uh, see what we got on that front. Now that we've taken a little bit of refrigerant out, let's re-input our readings here and see where we're currently at. So where we were before is that we were about 110% of refrigerant charge in this system. So if we scroll down here on our charge calculator, let's re-input our liquid pressure, temperature, suction pressure, and suction line temperature. So on our high side, 
what we're currently running is, let's call it 255. Our liquid line temperature, let's round up to 72. Suction pressure, that stayed the same of about 133. And our suction line temperature really didn't change at all. We'll call it 50, 58 degrees. Once you do that, you'll hit recalculate charge and we're getting there. So with that, we still need to remove some more refrigerant out of our system. So it looks like we're sitting about, eh, let's call it 105% um, of what we need in, in our equipment here. If we take a look at our subcooling numbers on our gauges, our subcooling dropped from about 16-ish to 13 degrees of subcooling and our superheat stayed about the same on that, which is what you'd want to expect on a TXV driven system. If you take a look at our charge calculator here, our subcooling number is right at 13 degrees of subcooling, which is pretty on compared to what our gauges are giving us here for our testing. Some guys will call in and want to know, you know, what's the accuracy of our charge calculator? Well, just by going off of this test alone, it looks like we're pretty darn close to our subcooling number. Now we would still need to remove some additional charge of our system to get our, our overall charge correct, but it's, it's pretty darn close. Again, with our charge calculator, it's telling us that we need to take out about two and a half ounces, you know, two to three ounces of charge. And then we should be at, um, at our charge amount. If we scroll down again here, we can take a look at our superheat number. So our superheat number, if we round up is about 12, so 11.9. So if we go over to our gauge set here again, our current superheat is uh, about 11 and a half. So we're really close to what our superheat number is telling us for our charge calculator and then what our gauges are telling us here. Also what you'll see on this is your target subcooling. So your target subcooling on our system, based on our conditions, is going to be about nine degrees of subcooling. So if we scroll back up here, we're still about 13 degrees of subcooling. So by taking those, say, two to three ounces out, that should bring us all the way back down to about nine degrees of subcooling for our target subcool, which is about nine. Now that's a little bit on the charging calculator. Again, the tool itself, meaning the charge calculator, is really good for commissioning equipment. So what this necessarily won't do is help you troubleshoot in regards to a restriction. Um, so when you do a new startup, um, we should have everything you know, free of a restriction, all that stuff. So when you go to start the system on for the first time, you wanna use this as a commissioning tool to ensure that your system is properly set up, properly charged, um, given the fact if you're running with a TXV driven system or if you're running with a piston system, which would be going off a of superheat. Um, it's going to look exactly the same. Uh, it'll just give you a target superheat number instead of a target subcooling number um, in relation to your charge. Another thing on our charge calculator is that we have a literature library link here. So at the top of that charge calculator, if you're wanting to get any kind of documentation on the unit that you're working on it takes you directly to our literature library so if you're looking at our particular condenser here which i just selected frigid air as our brand name we'll go under our heat pump split hit search we'll go down to our model here which is an fsh 1be model you then have our tabs here which i'm sure hopefully you guys are familiar with our literature website We'll have our tech specs, install instructions. If you wanted to get into that supplemental charging chart, which again, we give a lot more information on in regards to superheat, subcooling, what your pressure should be on your given conditions. Uh, this is where you're, where you're gonna find it. So if we go to our unit here, and actually I'll select it. This is our unit for cooling mode operation. So what you'll have here is your liquid pressure, your suction pressure, and your subcooling number, all based on what your outdoor ambient is, which ranges from 60 to 115 degrees. 
And then you'll need to take a uh, indoor wet bulb, which will range from 57 to 77 degrees. And that's where you can get additional charging information on the unit. If we scroll down one page, it'll be the same unit, but it's gonna be our heat pump charging information. So you will have our suction pressure, our discharge pressure, along with our discharge temperature, and this will help you charge the unit in, uh, in heat pump mode and, uh, and see what you got given what conditions you're, you're seeing, anywhere from zero all the way up to 60 degrees for an outdoor ambient. What you'll then also have to do in heat pump mode is take an indoor dry bulb, which will range anywhere from 68 degrees to 76 degrees. So again, the charge calculator, I wanted you guys to see that tool, know how it works, I did present this on a laptop or a browser, if you will, but it's gonna look exactly the same on your mobile device, whether you're using a phone or a tablet. The other side note that I'll point out is that you need to have internet access when using this tool, because this is a web-based program versus a app that you can download off of a, uh, you know, the App Store for Apple or the Google Play Store for Android phones, so you do, have to have internet access to use this charge calculator. So I hope this helps you guys in the field when you're looking at charge. Now let's take a look at your questions that I've been filling in over our training. Uh, so let's get into the first one and take a look. So the first question, um, which I, I can't remember if I addressed this in our hands-on training or not, was how do we force a defrost mode? So on our 14 sear uh, defrost board, along with um, our inverter driven side and on our 18 sear heat pump, all you have to do is jump those two little test pins out uh, for three seconds and that'll force a defrost. Um, so um, basically if you just, I just tell guys on the phone, take a screwdriver, short the pins out for three seconds. And then what should happen is um, the unit will go into defrost mode, which is essentially cooling mode. Um, and then it'll go through your normal defrost cycle, um, whether you hit termination temperature on the coil um, or uh, 11 minutes has gone by um, as far as your defrost mode. But that's how you force a defrost. Uh, probably the most number one question we get when it comes to that defrost board is, is how do I do that? So. Again, just take a, a, a flathead screwdriver, go across the, the uh, test terminals for three seconds and that'll force a defrost. Uh, as far as like uh, how long the training's gonna be, we're basically gonna go to the top of the hour, guys. So if I don't happen to get to your question, um, I can reach out to you uh, via email. Um, so I, I will certainly uh, do that if, if we get a, a flood of questions um, like we did yesterday and I wasn't able to get to everybody yesterday. So um, feel free to ask. If I don't get to it, apologize, but um, I will have your guys' email and, and I'll certainly reach out to you with, with that info. Uh, as far as codes go, another question revolving around um, uh, fault codes on our boards. So you can't recover faults. Um, basically what you will have is a, uh, a stored fault code and, and a stored fault code will be indicated. Um, you know, for example, if you're um, running in heat or cool mode, you may see C1 and H1 and then it may switch over to like an O2 code, for example. So if you had like an H1 and an O2 flashing back and forth, uh, that would give you a, a stored fault code, and normally the unit's going to be running. So just go through the, the clearing the fault codes, and um, and um, um, you can clear the board that way. Once you clear the fault codes, though, you can't go back and re uh, re pull that information up. So another question revolving around um, our, our QRD document, basically the question asks if, if I have a piston on the condenser and the indoor as a TXV, um, 
do we go off the TXV or the piston, um, and should the piston be left in? Um, basically, when you're dealing with, say, our 14 CR heat pump, which is a piston-driven outdoor in heat pump mode, and if you have a TXV on the indoor, um, when you're charging it, you're going to, or checking charge, I should say, you're going to be running it in cooling mode and you're going to be looking at your subcooling um, because you have an indoor TXV. And then um, if you're in the middle of summer, you can look at your superheat too. And also in heat pump mode, or actually, I'm sorry, not in heat pump mode because we're, we're charging it in cooling mode. Um, you can look at your superheat to make sure that TXV is operating properly. Now, on our 16 sear two-stage heat pumps and the inverter-driven heat pump, those will have a TXV on the outdoor unit, um, and those are going to be preset again to about uh, 10 to 15 degrees of superheat. So, as far as troubleshooting goes on those units, the 16 sear and the uh, the 18 sear, um, those don't change when it comes to um, checking the TXV like you would on an indoor coil. So it, th there's still going to be about um, 10 to 15 degrees of superheat on those TXVs as well. Uh, another question in regards to the charging sticker on the data plate. So those are going to be really close to uh, that charge calculator. So you can also go off of those stickers. Um, what I had also talked about was the supplemental charging chart, uh, which we give more information because some guys are old school, um, meaning that they want to know what their pressures are, what their high and low side pressure is during uh, heat pump or cooling mode versus going strictly off of a superheat number or a subcooling number. So the, the stickers that will be on the back of the condenser uh, panels um, is, is basically how you want to look at your charge. But if you want to know, like, per your conditions, what my pressure should be, um, and I'm kind of the same way too, is I want to know roughly where I need to be at on pressure. Um, if you go to the online uh, library, you can go to uh, that supplemental charging chart and you can pull that information um, whether you're running in cooling mode or running in heat pump mode. So um, that document's pretty big and so uh, we just ended up making that a separate uh, document instead of throwing that into every install instructions. Um, so uh, we just try to make it a little bit easier for you guys to find the information that you're needing. So when it comes to charging, on the QRD document, when you say when you uh, um, when you pick your your indoor equipment and then you have your tonnage at the top of your document and you basically connect this, the the uh, um, the boxes, if you will, um, in that box you'll have a what I refer to as either a highlighted or uh, a bolded text or a shaded gray uh, box determining if you have to change an outdoor or an indoor metering device. What you'll also have in that box is if you have to add any charge. So in parentheses there, um, underneath like a piston size, for example, uh, you may see like four ounces or five ounces. Um, for a number and that's the amount of charge that you have to add for that particular equipment. Um, if it's zero, you will see a zero. Um, if it's a negative number, which there are some equipment where it's actually a negative charge amount, meaning you have to remove a little bit charge uh, of charge for that matchup. Uh, there's only a handful of matchups that require that, but um, on the QRD document, that's where you can find that information if you, add, if you have to add charge for your particular matchup that you have. And again, that's going off 15 feet worth of line set. So if you're over 15 feet, you then have to take into account uh, the line set length in addition to the charge amount on that too. Uh, 
Um, another question on checking charge on a two-stage unit. Uh, when should we check it? So um, remember, uh, any time that you check charge, uh, you want to be at what's called nominal capacity, which you have to be in second stage for a two-stage uh, condenser. Um, if you're working on our inverter-driven stuff, you want to be in, say, C4, um, which is a Y2 call, and that's 100% of capacity. Um, a two-stage unit with a Y1, Y2, um, your Y2 is 100% capacity, Y1 is about 70%. Um, because if you're, if you're trying to check charge in Y1, you're going to get a bunch of readings that are not going to it's not going to make sense. So, um, like for example, generally when you're in first stage on an air conditioner, uh, your suction pressure is going to be a little bit higher than what you would normally have in a Y2 call. So, um, just make sure that you have a Y2 um, call from your stat. On the actual two-stage pieces of equipment, the, the easiest thing that I tell guys to do is to verify you're in Y2, and I believe I made a tech tip video on this as well. Uh, just unwire nut your Y2 wire and have a, a, a clamp amp around the compressor common, and if your amp draw falls, then you, then you were in your second stage. Uh, if it didn't fall, then we were in first stage, and we need to figure out why the unit's not going into second stage. So. Um, that's a quick and easy way to determine if you're in Y2. Um, another question regards to these uh, uh, webinars. So, um, the, uh, uh, these uh, webinars are going to be posted, I believe, on our EdgeTech website. So, I'm going to get with our communications department and make sure that we at least get that up on our EdgeTech site. Um, um, I believe they might put this on YouTube. I don't know if they will or not. Some of the lunch and learns that I've done in the past have been on YouTube, so um, we'll see. So either either uh, our EdgeTech website uh, will have it there, um, or on YouTube it'll be there um, as well. Um, it may take a little bit uh, of time for us to uh, finalize the product and get it uploaded. Um, but yeah, it, it'll be available to you guys if you either missed it or, or want to review it here. A lot of great questions, guys. If you still have uh, anything you want to ask over the topics today, just feel free to fire away here. Um, another thing I just want to touch on from yesterday, um, we do have what's called a job site check checklist available to you guys. Uh, basically, I'll just go through it real quick. It's just a two-page document where you have a bird's eye view of your refrigeration system where you can input information, uh, pressures and line temperatures and, and uh, calculate your superheat and subcooling pretty quickly. Um, those are really helpful because if you have like a bunch of readings and you can't really map it out, <clears throat> excuse me, in your head like where stuff is, um, those um, job site checklists are really good to uh, just write all your information down and then see what you have. And normally you can get to your answer pretty quick because normally if I have a, a guy on the phone where it's not making sense what he's telling me, um, Usually I'll, I'll just take one of those out, write everything down that he gives me, and normally I can tell him to go back and recheck a temperature here or recheck a pressure. Um, but yeah, those job site checklists, uh, check sheets are available on our literature library. Um, if you, like for example, go to a condenser unit, um, I believe it's going to be under um, uh, the other tab. On, on the tabs on our literature library, and it'll say job site, job site checklist on there. Um, but those are, those are great troubleshooting tools for you guys. Uh, another uh, question in regards to 
uh, the fault codes. Um, uh, the question states, can you access uh, more than one fault code at a time? So in regards to the defrost board on our 14 series equipment, um, you're just going to have one fault code pop up at a time. Um, now, um, you may have like another fault code pop up once we kind of uh, maybe fix a problem. Maybe we had a, a sensor problem or maybe we had a, a pressure switch that was stuck open and, and we fixed that problem and then we have another problem. Um, basically on the 14 tier board, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're only going to see one fault code on that. Now, on our inverter-driven stuff that's totally different, you can get a whole library of fault codes potentially uh, in regards to troubleshooting um, on that uh, inverter-driven unit. So on the, on the single-stage stuff, it's just going to be one fault code. On the inverter stuff, it could be, say, five, seven different fault codes that you could potentially get on the heat pump and the AC unit. Um, the, the one thing that I will point out on the inverter driven on the yeah, inverter driven unit or BG line is that if you have a fault code with a dot next to it on our inverter driven stuff, that is going to be an active fault code. Um, if you come up on one of our inverter driven stuff um, and you don't see a little dot or period next to the number, that's a stored fault code. So a dot is an active no dot is a stored on our BG line. So just wanted to throw that out there too. Um, uh, because normally what we do on those units is we have you clear the board and then start from scratch and see where, uh, see where you're at. So if the defrost board um, is in heat mode and we lose like a ambient or a coil sensor, that unit is going to shut down. Um, so um, in our training, hands-on training, what I did is I got rid of a sensor and the unit shut down on us. What's then going to happen is that um, the unit is going to output 24 volts on our W2 outwire. Um, so a very common call that we get into tech service, uh, generally it's on new startups, is that uh, there's a single black thermostat wire that's hanging loose off your W2 out. Um, you just want to make sure that you hook a thermostat wire to that black wire. And whatever color you pick, doesn't matter, um, um, to hook into that black wire, that color wire needs to land on the W terminal on the end door. So if you don't hook a thermostat wire to your W2 out, when the unit goes into defrost or if it fails to come on in heat pump mode, um, the unit can't send 24 volts inside to bring on your electric heat automatically. Um, generally how we find that the W2 wire isn't hooked up is that uh, the homeowner will generally say that um, every now and then you'll have really cold air coming out of your registers. And what that is, is that the electric heat or your gas furnace isn't kicking on to help supplement that air coming out of the register um, on that. So just make sure you hook up that W2 wire uh, to your W on the indoor. Um, another thing, and i um, running out of time here, uh, the last thing that I just wanted to touch on um, going into spring is, and we get this question a lot, is cleaning condenser coils. Um, when it comes to cleaning condenser coils, you want to make sure um, that you really use water if you can. Um, we really try to steer you guys away from using uh, coil cleaners and stuff like that mainly because if you don't get all that coil cleaner off the coil, um, it can eat away at the aluminum, so, which can cause a whole bunch of problems. So um, if you can, try to stay away from coil cleaners. Uh, just use soap and water. As far as soap goes, um, 
just use something that is uh, uh, basically as gentle, gentle as hand soap. Um, also too, if you end up using coil cleaner or you have to, dil dilute that way down um, and, and make sure you do a thorough uh, washing of that coil to make, you know, to get all that coil cleaner off because uh, coil cleaner can definitely eat at aluminum if, if you either don't rinse it off properly or you don't get it all off. Um, um, you know, I've seen uh, some pictures coming to tech on that. So, um, yeah, just make sure when we go into our spring startup, you know, when we're doing checking charge and all that good stuff, um, just make sure we use water um, when cleaning coils. Uh, and with that, guys, um, I, I'll just say right now, there's a flood of questions that have come in. Um, I wasn't able to get to everybody today. I will have your guys' email. Um, so I, again, I apologize that I'm, uh, I, can't go, I can't get to everybody today in regards to questions. So um, I will get back with you on that, but I just wanna appreciate your time um, as far as our spring training uh, for this year. And um, I hope you guys have a great spring um, a startup, a great new season coming ahead. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've got a, a whole list of questions here from you guys that I'm gonna uh, email back to you. But I just wanna wish you guys all the best on this coming year and thanks for watching and have a great day.